Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm so glad that we can have a little time together this afternoon. However much time you have or when you listen to it, maybe it's uh, first thing in the morning you listen to the podcast. I, it doesn't, you know, we're just happy that you're listening. So I want to say another special welcome to all of our new, our new friends in Montana. Now we're expanding the reach of Faith Radio so more people will hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're very appreciative of all the support that you've given Faith Radio that has enabled us to say yes when opportunities like this has presented themselves. So thank you very, very much. So today I'm so glad that I'm gathered around the studio with my friends for another episode of at least Two Jews and a Gentile. So glad to have uh, Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz with me. We'll have a little roll call. So, um, Enter and sign in, please. Matt, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Great. Uh, yep, my name is Matt Fry. I serve as the lead pastor of Grafted, uh, which is a church uh, that seeks to be hospitable to reaching the Jewish community for the sake of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, we're here in Edina, Minnesota, and I serve also as a uh, staff missionary with Chosen People Ministries uh, here in the cities as well. So we live here just west of uh, Minneapolis, and it's me and my wife and our two kids, and uh, yeah, it's a blast. And I've been attending uh, your church mm-hmm. uh, trying to come kind of regularly. Yeah, uh, it's so, great. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. been a pleasure to have you. And you you do an awesome job. Thank you. It's really, really good, and Thank I love you. it. Aaron. Great to be here, Aaron Broughton. I'm the senior pastor at Victory Baptist Church in Maple Grove, Minnesota, and my wife Mandy, and we have four wonderful children, uh, just want to serve the Lord together as a family. Uh, we've been involved in Jewish ministry for over 25 years, and part of that, we served six of those years in Israel. And uh, the work, praise God, the work is still going on, uh, even since we've been back in the States now. But our heart and desire is for the Jewish people and for Gentiles as well to know Yeshua, no Jesus. Mm-hmm. And you are the Gentile in the I, group. I am the token Gentile. Yes, so. yes. And you are very knowledgeable uh, in Jewish history and your experience in Israel is really um, amazing. So thanks for that. And Tom Berkowitz. I'm Tom Berkowitz. I'm the executive director of the Messianic Journey, uh, teaching the Bible through Jewish eyes in the context it was written. I've been involved with reaching out to Jewish people for 45 years from the time I said yes to him, all my first people I witnessed to were Jews. So, and that's where I learned uh, Jewish evangelism 101 with the rejections. Mm-hmm. So, I, my heart is that the church learns the context in which the scriptures were written. It was written by 43 Jews, and it has a Jewish mindset to it. And God had a plan that he chose that people and that ethnic group to write his word. So I think it's good to understand where they're coming from. And it, I think it enriches the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, to get things started today, I do want to talk about what's happening in Israel right now. And Iran just attacked Israel. And help us to understand how that ties to the covenants in the Bible and how this is a newsworthy thing for a believer. I think looking at the events, I mean, if if you've been watching the news, we're not exactly surprised. I mean, war and conflict is kind of um, normal, if you will, uh, in the Middle East. And with the the uh, the war in Gaza that's been going on since October 7th, um, you know, things are heating up. However, what's noteworthy about this is this is the first time that uh, Iran has directly attacked Israel. Now, one thing I will say, and I was talking to someone here the other day about this, is that um, a lot of... Depending on who you listen to on the news, it's usually skewed as um, there's a humanitarian crisis, things like that. But really, this war in Gaza is really Israel's war against Iran. Hamas is a proxy of Iran. So is Hezbollah in the north. So are the Houthis in Yemen. All these people, the traces go back to Iran clearly. 
And so now that Iran has made this um, direct attack over 300, nearly 350 projectiles of different sorts, uh, actually one of my Israeli friends who's a tour guide, he said this, that this is the first uh, flight uh, from Tehran to Israel since 1979. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's interesting. On Sunday we had – where I was on a Zoom call with people in Israel, and one of the people on the call was a major who heads up the ground forces in uh, Israel. And he clarified, this is just a, not a war that just happened. We've been in a state of war with Iran since 1979 when they said death to Israel. We took them serious, where the rest of the world thought it was just rhetoric. We take those threats serious. So this mm-hmm. is what's been going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's uh, talk a little bit as to how it relates to um, Scripture, because there are covenants in the Bible that I would love to talk about, because if you are a new student to God's Word or if you don't uh, feel like you understand the Old Testament very well, I've got a great panel here today that can help us build a foundation. So maybe we can talk today a little bit about uh the covenants yeah. that are that are discussed in Scripture. Yeah, well, when you're thinking about covenant, right, you're thinking about the topic uh, of partnership, right? It, it's a partnership, but it, it goes deeper than that. Like, it, it's built in uh, kind of to a relationship. And usually when you're dealing with covenants, uh, there are stipulations upon those covenants. And so when we're looking at Scripture in particular, uh, we're thinking of, of kind of a handful of, of them, some of those including the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, mm-hmm. and we can kind of lay some of those out uh, as as needed. But but ultimately, when we're thinking as followers of Jesus, we're thinking in terms of how all of those are pointing forward to what Jeremiah would call the new covenant. And this is a covenant that is established by Jesus, sealed in his blood and assured by his resurrection, where there's forgiveness of sin. And what it says is the law will be written on the hearts of God's people. So there's a distinction there where it's not simply uh, the law coming to God's people as gracious as that is, and then they're seeking to obey it. There's a sense in which God himself is indwelling his people uh, through the Holy Spirit because of the work of Jesus. And the result of that is that they begin to change from the inside out and not from the outside in. But in particular, as we're we're processing the topic uh, of Israel, this relates uh, most clearly to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, And this goes all the way back to to Genesis 12. So maybe before we go, there is a distinction between the Mosaic. When you say the covenant, everybody usually goes to the Mosaic. That's a conditional. Correct. Correct. Covenant. It's a marriage covenant between God and Israel. And he laid out in Exodus 19 and Exodus 24 what would you call the ketubah, the terms of it. That can be violated. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant are unconditional. It's not based on our performance. Right. This is something God is going to do. Yeah. No matter what our performance is. I think this leads, uh, I just want to read a section of Genesis 15, because I think this is relevant, and we'll come back to 12, and maybe Aaron, if you want to dive into 12 when we get there, but this speaks to the conditionality. When we're thinking about the covenant that God made with Abraham, he says to him in in chapter 15 and verse 7 of Genesis, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess, and Abraham questions it. He says, how how am I going to know? Can you give me evidence? Can you give me some assurance Lord, how, how do I know I'm going to get it? And so the Lord tells him to bring him a number of animals, and he brings them, and he cuts them in half, and he lays them out. And mm-hmm. so in the ancient world, one of the ways that you would establish covenants or that you would uh, enter into that agreement or that uh, talking about the ketubah, as, as uh, Tom was talking about, is you would take animals, you would cut them, and you would walk through those animals. And as you walked through it, you would announce or you would declare uh, the stipulations or your side of the partnership. And what that symbolized was, uh, if I break my end of the partnership, may what was done to these animals be done to me. And when we read this text, it's interesting. It says, verse 12, as the sun's going down, a deep sleep falls on Abram and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to him, no, for certain. And he goes all the way uh, talking about the idea of the exodus and that they'll come out after a number of years of the exodus. And then verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Uh, the, the seeming uh, 
consistent conception by scholars of this is that this symbolizes God's presence in the midst of that covenant. And what we see is that it was God who went through those pieces, and there's no indication that Abram did. And so the the point of that is this, is that the covenant rises and falls not on Abraham holding up his end of the deal, but on God's faithfulness to fulfill the promise. And so let's maybe just go back for a minute to that promise in chapter 12 and and what that looked like. Before we do. Yeah. This is unique because think about where Abram was at this time. This is 10 years into his walk. So he's 85 years old. And Sarah is 75 and telling him that they were going to have a child naturally and they would be his physical descendants was hard. So in verse 4, it says, Uh, Or verse 5, it says, And he took him outside, God took Abram outside, and he said, Look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. Mm -hmm. When he walked outside, it was sunshine and blue sky. There was no stars in in the sky, but he trusted, just as that metaphor and that picture looks, that there's stars behind it. So then it says, Abram believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. The sun doesn't go down until verse 12 as Matt started reading. So when he looked up, there was no stars, but he by faith knew that there's stars behind there. And God is using that. And Abram believed, even though he's 85 years old, no child, Mm -hmm. and his wife was 75. So at this point, was there no, no... No Moses, no law, and no circumcision Circumcision at this point? or You're 100% correct. Okay. Yeah. This all predates that. Oh, that, yeah. That's, and that's kind of, that comes up in the New Testament of, of, of how do we navigate where the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant fits into this. But with covenants are often signs. I think that's something, to import, something important to remember, too. So with Noah, this is one that many are familiar with, the rainbow is a sign of that covenant. Uh, when we think about uh, the sign of the covenant with Abraham, it is circumcision. And part of the kind of ironic imagery of that is he says he's going to have a son and he's old and his wife is, as the text would say, past the years of having children. And so God says, so you know it was me, you're going to mark your baby maker to remind me it was me that gave you the child and not yourself. Right. And this is very, uh, it's a little graphic, but it's a very profound image. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the rainbow, Matt Fry, uh, how did how did we let the rainbow get hijacked by <laughs> the LGBTQ community? Well, That's the ours. evil one always hijacks what is good yeah. and holy, and all of a sudden we can no longer say it. That's nuts. All right, we're going to take a little break. You are listening to at least two Jews and a Gentile. I've got Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz as my guest today. And we're going to be right back continuing our discussion on covenants. And if you've never really fully understood covenants in the Old Testament, uh, we're going to cover that today. So make sure you don't go anywhere. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. I can't believe how much I love podcasts. They're always ready, always available whenever you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're out for a walk with the dog or if you are at the gym or if you're driving and you want to listen to a podcast at any time, There they are, ready and waiting for you. One of the great things about podcasts is listeners, supporters like you make it all possible. And because of our spring fundraising event, now would be a perfect time for you to say, yes, I can make a contribution to this because I love podcasts. You can give right now by clicking the link in the show notes or you can go to myfaithradio.com. Thanks and enjoy the podcast. I hope you've had a good day. Thanks for tuning in. It is at least two Jews and a Gentile day. I'm so glad to have Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz as my panel. And what an awesome discussion we're having so far about covenants. And we're all the way up to Genesis chapter 12 already. And Aaron, I'm going to let you take over. You know, when we talk about Abraham and uh, the covenants, we've got to begin with with him, obviously. And uh, kind of looking at the overall picture, you know, Genesis 1 through 11 is really a foundation for really the Bible, you know, where does sin come from? Where did the promise of a redeemer come from? Uh, and then you have the confusion at Babel and the dispersion of the the uh, the people, uh, dispersion of the nations, the table of nations in, in chapter 10. And like I said, is there any hope for mankind? 
and all of a sudden enter Abraham. And so Genesis 12 really begins this. This is really the beginning of the history, really, of the Jewish people. And I would say this, that if there's one person who people um, claim as their hero, about half of the world's population claim Abraham as a hero. Mm-hmm. Those are Christians, Jewish, Muslim uh, backgrounds mm-hmm. claim Abraham as a hero. It's interesting, though, that Abraham's life is very, um, uh, I, I would say he's he's kind of this, uh, what do you do with him? There's a lot of changes in his life, but God starts out by giving him a promise. He says to get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He says, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. And you will be a blessing. So God promised Abraham really three things. He will promise him a land. He promised a nation or a family and then a great name. And indeed, that, that has happened. So how, how do we get this blessing or where does this blessing come from? God used the family of Abraham to give us two great gifts of eternal value, the word of God and the God of the word, the Messiah, Yeshua. Mm-hmm. And for that, we should be eternally grateful. And so don't overlook Abraham. Um, this is very important. And in verse three, this is kind of the, the thrust of that. Not just God is going to bless Abraham and from you is going to come all these great things and you'll have these great things. He says that I will bless those that bless you, Abraham, and curse them that curse you. And so this is uh, and, and not just that, that, but through you, Abraham, all families or all nations of the earth will be blessed. And so this blessing, again, as we've talked about, this is an unconditional. Abraham didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to run laps. You didn't have to ride through the desert on a camel with no name. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. what, talk He's, about, you know, he just went. And verse four simply says, and Abraham departed. Abraham went. And in Hebrew, it's lech lecha. He went. He, he, in fact, it's like being thrust out. Abraham did that without questioning. I like what Dr. Warren Worsby said one time that God's people don't live on explanations. They live by promises. Mm. And that's exactly what Abraham did. And so talking about covenants, this is God's promise. It's an unconditional promise. I really like that. Aaron Broughton, thank you for that. You know, God told Abraham to go, and he just got up and went. You know, he didn't say, well, I'm going to meet with my small group and discuss this, <laughs> you know, get some counsel. He just obeyed God. Well, can you imagine that that uh, conversation with Sarah? Uh, <laughs> honey, we need to pack up. <laughs> okay, where are we going? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> not sure. Yeah. We're just going to be obedient, though. We're going to go. Yeah. 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 I think this ties a little bit, if we want to bring it back to the Israel conversation, e- even now, and, and I'm going to address this biblically, uh, but I think as we consider how does this promise fit into us as believers and, and how we think about uh, that land over there, that that land that is being fought about, that, that the land that is the, uh, the the hotbed of controversy right now in the news, uh, when we're processing this, we have to recognize Genesis 12, God promised a land to Abram. And no matter what your kind of interpretive lens is, uh, I don't think that we can, with integrity, come to this text and say, well, now that Jesus has come, it's now just kind of a spiritual promise or mm. it's something that's been, uh, you know, it, it's something that's already been fulfilled. I think that if God has integrity, if God is true to his promises, if God can communicate with human beings uh, in any way that they can receive it and comprehend it, Abram thought he was getting a land. He thought he was getting a place. And I think that that is exactly what God intended. And in case he was confused and didn't understand it, God repeated that promise 71 times. In the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. There's no ambiguity. I once heard a, a pastor of a mega church saying God is not in the real estate business. Well, it kind of reads like that when I <laughs> look at the word. I mean, with exact boundaries. Yeah. So sounds like he's in the business. Yeah. You know, one thing about Abraham, too, he was a man of really two things. He was a man of tents and altars. Everywhere Abraham went, he pitched his tent, He set up his tent in different places. He starts coming from Shechem, which is the modern-day Nablus, works his way through Bethel to Hebron, and then he goes to Egypt for a little rendezvous, which probably wasn't ill-advised, <laughs> and then comes back eventually at Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. But everywhere Abraham goes, he pitches a tent, but also at those places, he also builds an altar. And that really shows one key aspect of Abraham. He was a man of faith, but in order to have faith, you have to have humility. Abraham never questioned God. It's never shared anyway. 
but he always built an altar. In other words, he understood that this world was not his home, so to speak. He was looking for that city whose builder and maker was God. But yes, in that, God provided for him this land. And uh, what a blessing that one day we'll have that full fulfillment from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. One day that they will receive all that in its fullness. And really, there's evidence in Genesis 18 that he loved God. He didn't want Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed because he was concerned about the reputation of God. Granted, his nephew Lot was there, but he said, what will people think? For your name's sake, would you destroy the, the city if there was 45? And then we know the story going down, but he was concerned about his holy name. The story of God in general through the scriptures, we have to recognize is indeed God's story, right? It is, it is centered on him. It is centered on his work and his promises. And, and Tom, that even brings to mind when I think about Moses um, and the golden calf incident happens with Israel and, and the Lord says, they justly deserve my wrath. I'm going to wipe, wipe them out, Moses, and start with you. What does Moses do? He doesn't try and convince them based on how good Israel is. Uh, in the same way that, that Abraham gets these promises not based on how good he is. It's, it's not about our own personal righteousness. It's about who God is. And when Moses talks to God and tries to intercede on behalf of Israel, what does he do? He, he says, God, what are people going to think of, of you this is who you are. This is the promise that, that you have made. He, he speaks God's character back to him. And the whole story of God is grounded in the God who is faithful in his character and to his promise. And we said all the way throughout, not just in, in the book of Genesis. Right. And that runs throughout what we would call the heroes of faith in the Bible. David, when he did the ill-advised census, he argued, for your, I will rather come under your mercy than subject myself to the nature or to the enemy. So let me take your punishment, your mercy. Mm-hmm. When I look at Abraham, and I don't know if you guys agree with this or not, but I see Abraham as a, a, a man whose circumstances didn't master him. Mm. He was not, I mean, he, he, the Lord said, I'll give you land. And Abraham said, where? God says, well, I'll tell you later, just wander. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. And and I would feel so overwhelmed, <laughs> like these circumstances are, are really too hard. And then God says, I'll give you a child. And Abraham says, how? I'll tell you later. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of hurry up and waiting going on, isn't there? Yeah. And he has no written word. Right. Yep. There was there was no synagogues. There was absolutely no churches, no written scripture. So how would he know? Yeah. There's a sense, I think, though, just as we process our own walk. Because this is the typical thing we do. We compare ourselves to the characters in Scripture. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad because they're not the standard for us. Jesus is, is the standard and, and the example. Uh, but we can learn from, from watching their life in the good and the bad. And with Abraham, uh, he is a complex person. And I think Aaron kind of alluded to this. Or there's moments where he kind of pawns his wife off when he, he feels threatened. Uh, and and there, there's senses here where like he he doubts in small moments or he he frets in small moments. But but like you, you had referenced here, there's a sense where uh, he keeps his eye on the ball. If yeah. we use that example, it doesn't mean he never stumbles and it doesn't mean he never swings and misses. But it means he keeps his eye on the ball. In this case, it was the God and the God who had made promises to him. Does it inspire us uh, as we read uh, what, what Abraham did and how he responded? to face the, the difficulties of life and get through them? Absolutely. You know, when God called, actually, let's do the, there's actually two callings of Abraham mm-hmm. in Genesis. The first call is in Genesis 12, uh, Lech Lecha, go from your father's house, go to land I will show you, you'll figure it out later. <laughs> okay? The second call of Abraham is in Genesis 22. God says to uh, take now your son Isaac, who you love, to the land of Moriah. It's another lech lecha. It's another get up and go. He comes to Mount Moriah in three days journey. He goes there. And of course he comes and he puts um, Isaac on the altar. He's about ready to sacrifice. And of course we know the angel stops him. And the, the word is interesting. It says here, the angel of the Lord calls out of heaven, says, Abraham, Abraham he says, here I am. He says, lay not your, son, your, your hand upon your son. and Do not do anything unto him. For now I see that you fear God. See that thou is withheld thy son 
thine only son for me. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, this really shows that Abraham's heart was in tune to God. He was, in the book of James, he's called a friend of God. There, I don't think there's anyone else in the Bible that has exactly that title. To have to be known as a friend of God implies that intimacy that he has. So, yes, like Tom said, he had no Bible, no church, no mm-hmm. synagogue, you know, for whatever it, it meant. But he had that close relationship with God. He was dependent, and I think that was part of that humility. The tents and altars uh, idea that mm-hmm. he had, these were places that were central to him. I think this is what I challenged our church on. I've been preaching about Abraham recently. And uh, Abraham went from uh, getting his homeland, you know, to to uh, the land of Canaan, land of promise. And uh, we kind of asked people, you know, where are you from? I could ask the guys here. I could ask our listeners, where are you from? For some people, that's a loaded question. Well, where is that where I was born, where I grew up in my childhood, where I am at now? Some people have moved in from Min- to Minnesota or Montana now, you know, wherever it may be. Mm-hmm. But the question is this. If you asked Abraham that, where is he from? Ur? From Haran? From Beersheba? From where? But I don't think he'd have any trouble telling you where he was going. Hmm. And so that's, that's the question that I think we can be presented with and understanding the unconditional covenant of God to Abraham is this. Where are you from? So a lot of we talk about having roots in our lives. I think a better word is anchors. There's times in our life we pull up anchor and we drop it in certain places in our life. And at that time, we invest in relationships, communications, maybe work, things like that. But the thing is this, we should take and drop those anchors and see the hand of God in our lives. And that's exactly what Abraham, Abraham dropped anchor. And when God said, get up and go again, he pulled the anchor up and went. So we should be people Mm -hmm. who live by anchors. And what were his anchors in life? They were his altars. And those altars were places where he responded to God. And that's a great example. So where are you from? Well, I'm from a lot of places myself, but I know for sure where I'm going. That's a great point. The thing I liked about Abraham is in Genesis 12, he just goes. Maybe it's blind faith, whatever the reason. But when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac, he was 125 years old. So he had been walking with the Lord for 50 years. And the book of Hebrews said, he, as he was walking, he knew God was faithful to his promise that somehow he would resurrect Isaac as he went through the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It wasn't if he was going to sacrifice right. this. He was going to do it, but God is faithful to his promise. Well, that gives us all hope. Yeah. We're, and it gives us a motivation. It's more than sometimes what the church does in this in our country is let's get them saved, and now they're in the, in the pews. But we don't work on growing them, sanctifying them, letting their faith grow. Mm-hmm. It's through life, and we see God's faithfulness in the hard times that we can grow in faith. Mm-hmm. I don't think God would have, Abraham would have said yes to God 50 years before. Hmm. Yeah, we'll take a little break and come right back. It's at least two Jews and a Gentile. Thanks for tuning in. We're continuing our discussion on covenants, and it is fascinating. If you've missed any of this, make sure you check it out from the beginning at MyFaithRadio.com. Be right back. I like using the word synergy. I don't know exactly what it means all the time, but I like using it because I think it's a cool word. And uh, just because we were on a break, that doesn't mean we stopped talking because we were talking very, very uh, fast through the break. And Matt Fry brought up an interesting point, raised a question, and I said, Matt, 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 Matt pause and just say that again on the air. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, well, I, I think when we're thinking about the gospel, this is something I, I, I've said more than once to people is... Uh, the gospel is not just good news for us who already believe, of, of course it is, uh, but it's news that needs to be shared with, with people. And and as we're thinking about Abraham, like we're thinking about uh, the father of the Jewish people effectively here. You know, God ultimately being the father of them, as the prophets would say, but there's a sense here in which they trace their lineage back to him. And, and you know, maybe you're listening to this and maybe you're, you are Jewish and you're not a follower of Jesus and you're just 
tuning in for some reason, or maybe you're here and you're a believer and uh, you have Jewish friends or you have Jewish family and you're thinking about how to reach them. I, I just want to challenge us with a question in light of Abraham and thinking about those anchors and altars and all of that uh, is, what is what does it mean to be Jewish? What, what does that mean fundamentally? And we talked about that, I think, in one of our early episodes, kind of theoretically. But practically speaking, I would venture to say that being Jewish is not just uh, about ethnicity or religious expression or association with family or tradition, but being Jewish is fundamentally at its heart, according to Scripture, maybe not according to people's modern conceptions, but according to Scripture, is following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wherever he leads, right? You may not know where, where you're, you came from, but you know where you're going, right? You, you have a sense uh, of that l- the Lord is leading you somewhere, and wherever he is, that's where you want to be. And I think this leads us to a bigger question as we think about uh, the covenants. Uh, the scriptures would say that the Lord is uh, leading us to be ruled by one who is called the son of David, the one who is the anointed one, the Mashiach. And so the question for us, for some of us in the room as Jewish people, is could the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have taken on flesh himself and revealed himself in that son of David? And so I'm going to give it to Aaron to kind of talk about where that son of David language comes from. So when we talk about the covenants, we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. There's the land covenant. Um, later, later on, we're talking about the Mosaic. And then the new mm-hmm. covenant we touched on briefly. Another one is in there is the Davidic covenant. And God promised David, because David was a man after God's own heart, God selected him to be king over Israel. And in Second Samuel chapter 7 refers to what we call the Davidic covenant, where he basically says that David's house and his kingdom will be established forever. His throne will be established forever. And so uh, David's line uh, definitely was there, but we see that even broken off in um, 586 B.C. when the Babylonians come. Um, Jehoiakim is the last of the kings. Anyways, they're brought to Babylon. And then all of a sudden, there's like this gap for several years. Will, will the king of Israel ever stand up? Well, we're introduced to, of course, in the New Testament, we're introduced to Jesus, Yeshua, as being the fulfillment of that. However... Regardless of that, so I, I even talk to my Jewish friends, my Jewish brothers here. If we don't have the even the New Testament, the Berit HaDashah, the New Covenant, how can we know that God has a plan for a someone who will be on the throne of Israel forever? In Psalm chapter 2, it talks about uh, why do the heathen rage? Why do the nations rage? Why are they in the rebellion? Why do they imagine a vain thing? Uh, this whole passage, or 12 verses here, really talk about uh, that the kings of the earth have basically rebelled against his Mashiach, his anointed. And this is going back to David. Now, there are some commentators, I go back to even Rashi, who is a medieval, uh, one of the greatest scholars, Jewish scholars of all time, very well respected. And uh, I would, he would probably take all of us to put together, <laughs> you know, he's just a brilliant man. However, he argued that this Mashiach, this anointed, is simply referring to David, and that he had problems with his enemies, specifically the Philistines. And uh, so, yeah, one day the Philistines will be destroyed. However, this passage in Psalm 2 really talks of something even greater, that the nations here, this is really talking about the world. The whole world is going to rebel against the king that God has brought, the, the anointed, the Mashiach. And then it says at the very end, to kiss the son or do homage to the son, lest he be angry and perish in the way. And so, and then it says, blessed are those who put their trust in him. So the call is this, for the whole world, not just for the Philistines or whoever rebels against David, but this is a greater message that's universal for both Jew and Gentile. Hmm. And this is that blessed are those, those who trust, who put their trust in will get safety under the king Hmm. from the line of David, the son of David. Hmm. And the only person who fits that, and by the way, Psalm 1 and 2 really work as an introduction to the rest of the Psalms. Blessed is the man who walks down the counsel of godly, stands in the way of sinners, sits in the seat of the scornful. Uh, I remember memorizing that when I was little. I love that Psalm to this day, but we say, well, who is that man who walks down the counsel of the godly? I think if you tie Psalm 1 and 2 together, that's an introduction to the whole book of Psalms in saying this, that this Messiah is that blessed man. He is the one who meditates in the law day and night. He is the one planted by a tree. The ungodly will be destroyed in, under, the, under the authority of the king. Hmm. And so how important it is for us in these days that we should submit and put our trust in God's anointed, the Messiah, 
and that is the son of David, and the only person who fits that bill, enter in the genealogy in Matthew, yeah. a Jewish man yeah. who writes the genealogy, and Jesus introduced the son of Abraham, the son of David. You put those covenants together, and it's fulfilled in Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Wow. Well done, Aaron Broughton. That was fun. <laughs> no, you did. You did. You did a great job. Great job there, yeah. I'm like yeah. ready to because stand up and of, applaud. In the Talmud, they combine Psalm 1 and 2. They just don't see the end. And Rashi was correct. It was probably written for David, but it was in prophetic present. So it was mm-hmm. true then, but more true in the future. Absolutely. You know, the, the book of Psalms is not just a random collection. Sometimes we come across that way, but it was put in order. And even uh, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, he wrote and he prophesied by the Spirit. And so this is prophecy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When Jesus is speaking in, in Matthew 11, this is something that's stuck with me recently is he says, he's talking about John the Immerser, John the Baptist, as some of us would call him. Uh, And and he says, the law and the prophets, they prophesied until John. And and when uh, when the law and the prophets comes up, it's usually kind of a catchphrase of talking about the the entire Hebrew scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings, what we would call in Hebrew the Tanakh. And it just makes me think about no matter where we're reading in scripture, it all prophesies, not in the sense that it is all prophecy in the classic sense, but it is all pointing forward in the story. It is all pointing forward to uh, some, not just something that God is going to do, although that is true, but that something occurs because of someone, and, right. and that is because of Jesus. Right. And if you look at it this way, God gave the Torah, the first five books, to Israel. Yeah. The prophets explained what was in the first five books, mm. and then Jesus took it and heightened yeah. what was explained. Mm. So it was all from Jesus taught 100% from uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh. Yeah. Yep. We've not touched on the covenant God made with Noah. Mm. Did we understand that to be a covenant, or did we understand what covenant was after the flood? Yeah, I think I think that covenant, it's worth recognizing, um, is not just a biblical idea, right? We, for us as believers, you know, we think of covenant and we're like, oh, the covenants of the Bible. Mm-hmm. But but covenants are greater than uh, they're, they're they're extra biblical, right? So so in the ancient world, uh, it wasn't just Israel making covenants. In in fact, the Lord, in in some ways, you might say, accommodated Israel by entering into covenants with them in the way that he did, because the other nations would do it in a certain way. And he comes in and says, I'm going to enter into a covenant with you in a way that you will get that we're entering into a covenant. And and so when we're thinking about covenant, yeah, I, I, I think that when we're looking at a specifically uh, the early chapters of Genesis with Noah, uh, covenants are, are definitely a category uh, that an ancient person would have got. But but yeah, we did skip over it. Someone want to kind of jump into that? Go ahead. Okay. So in Genesis chapter 9, this is after the flood, mm-hmm. and so God makes his covenant. And the sign of the covenant is, uh, number one, he says, I will not uh, basically destroy the earth like I did, okay? So in other words, there's not going to be this, this worldwide flood. And then he says, I'm going to put my bow in the cloud. I'm going to put a rainbow, basically. That will be a token of the covenant. So whenever we see a rainbow, uh, no matter what modern interpretation may be nowadays of it, yeah. this is God's plan uh, to share that I will not destroy. In other words, this is his care. This is his love that he has displayed, and it was through the one that he loved, Noah. The, by the way, the word Noah or Noah in Hebrew means comfort, the comfort of God. And so, anyways, the rainbow really is a sign of God's comfort, mm-hmm. but it's also kind of a warning uh, for uh, those who rebel against God. Remember what God did. He does take sin seriously, mm-hmm. and so God is very. Um, interested in the affairs of man. Mm. He's very uh, interested in how mankind behaves and all that. We cannot live just however we want. And so this is very important that we understand this covenant uh, as well that really is displayed around the world. Mm. Mm, Good point. We're going to take a little break. You are listening to at least two Jews and a Gentile. My guests today are Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz. We're going to continue our discussion on covenants, but also when we come back to, I want to talk about Passover. We'll be right back. I'm Carmen LaBurge, host of Mornings with Carmen. I love a good story, don't you? I love a good love story, a good mystery, a good travel log. I love a good turnaround story or a story that begins once upon a time and ends with happily ever after. So what's your story? 
specifically your Jesus story. What difference does Jesus make in your life? Could you tell it as a love story or a rescue story? However you tell it, trust me, we want to hear it. We love a good story. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. Welcome to the show. If you just tuned in, uh, where have you been? Probably working, getting ready for something else today. But we're glad that you joined. We're talking about covenants today uh, with at least two Jews and a Gentile. I've got Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz. And Aaron Broughton would be the token Gentile in the group. Hey, it's still great to be here. He's not token, though. <laughs> no, he's not token. His no. Hebrew is great. He's awesome. Yeah, your yeah. Hebrew is really good. The the Hebrew about go, what what was that again? Lech lecha. See, I'd like to try saying that, but it would sound like I'm clearing my throat. <laughs> so I'm not going to try. Not on the it's air anyway. It's basically the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tom Berkowitz, let's get to the, the New Covenant. Yeah, new, the New Covenant is really interesting to me because I, I ask Christians, where is the New Covenant in the Bible? Virtually no one knows where it is. One person said, well, I think it's Hebrews 8. Mm -hmm. And they were correct, but it comes from Jeremiah. And it's different from the other covenants in a one special way. And the new covenant says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing, and their sin I will remember no longer. The interesting thing about this covenant is, when Jeremiah said it, it just hung there for 500 years. All the other covenants was ratified by blood right away. And no covenant is in place unless it's ratified by blood. So when was it ratified? Approximately 500 years later, Mm -hmm. Jesus walks the earth and he ratified this covenant because he said he is the new covenant on the cross. And that's where he instituted what we call communion, Mm -hmm. not to forget uh, what he has done. In the, it is the blood of the new covenant. So he ratified that. It's different. It's unlike the Mosaic covenant, which instituted the sacrificial system. This one, God died mm-hmm. that we might live. His blood, God's blood, mm. covered our sins. It's good. See? Amen. So it's kind of like the ultimate Passover story. Yeah, let's let's talk about Passover, maybe just a little bit of a tease, and then Mm -hmm. I do want to address the next time we gather around the studio table, because I think it's a big topic, and you guys have a lot to say about it. Yeah, I mean, Passover is one of, if not the biggest holiday within the Jewish community, at least some of the most well-known, and even if you're not Jewish, you've probably heard of Passover in some shape or form, but... Uh, we're going to get into it uh, in the next the next time we're on, but I, I think it's something that is worth uh, recognizing because it's such a clear depiction of Jesus and his atoning work. It points us so clearly to one of the themes we've seen uh, is that in these covenants is kind of built in both mercy and judgment, right? Where we see that God is is just to punish sin, to right every wrong. And yet, on those who would come under his shelter, those who would kiss the sun, as Psalm 2 would say, uh, there is uh, the covering of righteousness for them. And Passover just depicts that super clear. Mm -hmm. Matt Fry, could I ask you a question? Because at your church, about a month ago as I was there, Mm -hmm. you were talking about the celebration of of Easter, Mm -hmm. but then you were going to later do the celebration of Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. And that was, uh, as a Gentile, a little confusing. And I wasn't <laughs> sure exactly what you meant, but yeah. I was too embarrassed to ask. 
Yeah. So why don't I just do it publicly on the air right now? Yeah, so kind of a, a quick explanation, and I want to be sensitive to the way we, we navigate some of this, is is there's just some historical uh, dynamics at play with uh, the church calendar and with the Jewish calendar. Uh, and so sometimes they line up uh, when it comes to Passover lining up with Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Sometimes they don't. And mm-hmm. so the church kind of has its, its locked-in-place traditional date of Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but sometimes it becomes... Uh, unhitched, to use that language, uh, from the Jewish calendar. And that's sometimes unfortunate, like this year, where we've already passed Resurrection Sunday, but Passover is the end of this month. And Mm -hmm. so if we think about what we're remembering, you end up with, well, we're going to remember that Jesus uh, was resurrected, and a month later we'll remember he died, right? And you end up a little bit out of order. But when you kind of reacclimate yourself around the Jewish calendar— you can do the whole uh, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits uh, progression, which maybe we can talk about in the next segment, uh, where you can recognize Jesus' death, his atoning sacrifice, and then on that, that third day that he was indeed raised. It just kind of creates a smoother transition. And so it grafted what we did, and mm-hmm. I, if you were there for that, is on Resurrection Sunday, we honored the gospel and, right. and the fact that it is the, you know, the heartbeat of who we are. And we talked about what the gospel is. Uh, and how it applies uh, when we're seeking to reach Jewish people with that very news. All what, right. Um, what go ahead, Matt John. just pointed out, the difference between Easter celebration and the resurrection on the calendar and why it's so far, yeah. is dates back to the Council of Nicaea, where Constantine wanted to take anything Jewish out of the church. So he changed the calendar and to keep them in the same equinox, he, the first Easter from him was as far away from Passover as you could get to keep them in the same t- time period, mm-hmm. same spring equinox. So that's a, another seed of anti-Semitism. Yeah, that's a complex topic. And so I think the question that we need to ask ourselves then as believers is how do we navigate that? Because right. there, there's a reality of, of, you know, we have Resurrection Sunday, and we want to honor the fact that the church across the board is celebrating the resurrection of Israel's Messiah. And we can rejoice in that on one hand and still grieve that there's some sense in which the, the complexity of the history trends towards some expression of anti-Semitism. And so um, this is not an easy history, but I think if we own it and just say this is the reality but the reality is also that Jesus was raised and center ourselves on his resurrection. We find ourselves in a much healthier spot. Amen. Mm-hmm. Now, I know we're going to, in the next time we gather around the studio, we're going to have a full discussion on the Passover. But there is a, a Seder dinner, and all of you are participating. And I know, Aaron and Matt, you have uh, public offerings of a, attending yeah. a Seder dinner. Yeah. So I would be only talking to the people in the greater Twin Cities area right now, so I want to make this brief, not to exclude anybody, but uh, how would they find out about maybe attending a a Seder dinner? Yeah, so if you're in the Twin Cities and you want to come to Grafted Seder, there is uh, one more day left to RSVP, but we would love if you'd be there. Uh, The information for that, you can go to graftedcommunity.com slash Passover, and it'll give you the details you need. Mm Mm-hmm. And Aaron, you're having a Seder as well, aren't you? Yes, we'll have it on Wednesday on April 24th at Victory Baptist Church in Maple Grove, victorybaptistmg.org. You can contact us there and uh, love to have folks come and see Messiah in the Passover. I awesome. call it learning the Bible using your five senses. Well, I like that. It's good. Sure. And Tom, and you and Marsha hold a number of Seders, don't you? Right. We've had one private one. Mm-hmm. We have our family one. We're going to actually do it uh, uh this Friday, and then we are doing another private one for a group of people. And for those who are outside the Twin City area, go on to Chosen People's website, yeah. and they have, uh, they're doing Passovers at all kinds of churches, mm-hmm. and really it will enhance and enrich your faith mm-hmm. by going through it. They're doing a virtual one, too. I just got an email about it. So you awesome. can go on the website and follow okay, along. Okay, there you go. So they can it's... go to our friend Marty Getz, martygetz.com. He's doing a virtual one, and the music is great. With the music them. will be good in that one, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, so there go, there go. Again, we've got an opportunity for everybody to participate in a Seder experience, whether yeah. it's virtual or in person. So that's awesome. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. That wraps up the time we have. Um, So once again, thank you. And that's all the show we have for today. But I so appreciate 
Uh, Matt Fry, Aaron Broughton, and Tom Berkowitz for my At Least Two Jews and a Gentile panel. They did an awesome job, and I hope you have a wonderful night, and I will see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.